welcome to the Schmidt House. I guess I can mention that briefly too. We're, it was built in 1904, and the more modern section that we're in is the extension. That's only 115 years old, 1910. So it's rather the the, the modern part. Uh, it was built for and by Leopold and Johanna Schmidt, and today is owned by the Olympia Tumwater Foundation, who's hosting these talks in conjunction with the city of Olympia or Tumwater. So Olympia, my goodness, city of Tumwater. <laughs> We're related to Olympia, sort of. We're older than them. Uh, a restroom for your visitors. Uh, under the front stairway, yeah, there's a little tiny restroom that you can use if you need to. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, also, for the sake of making this hour more conducive to the era we're talking about, you might, might want to take a moment to silence your cell phones and pagers and beepers and all those contraptions that are smarter than us. If you <laughs> just put them on vibrate or, and if I see you jump up, I'll know what's happening. Here in 2015, we have that uh, great lineup of speakers scheduled. I, I hope you get a copy of that before you leave, if you haven't already. Um, in fact, I can even highlight a couple things here for you while we have time. Um, next month, on February 19th, Karen Johnson will be here. And she's a local historian and author, and she's worked with uh, Lewis County and Cowlitz County and Bigelow House and different places. And she's with the Tumwater Historical Association now. But she'll be talking about it. Well, the talk is titled Through the Bowels of the Land, which is kind of appetizing. But it's the, the Cowlitz Trail from the Columbia River to Puget Sound, which is an extension of the Oregon Trail. So she'll be talking about that. And then in March, we have Drew Crooks, who's expert in, well, he's a noted local historian also. And he'll be speaking about the Hudson Bay Company and the British influence as it transitioned into the American influence on Puget Sound. So that should be a good talk. And April, Andy Skinner from the Lewis County uh, Museum will be in April. And he's, he'll be talking about our neighboring county to the south. And before we were Thurston County, we were actually Lewis County for a short time. So we have a relation there. Uh, May 21st, it won't be a talk as much. Well, it will be a talk, but it'll be different. It's not the slideshow kind. It's a, an actor, uh, Ray Egan, and he portrays Ezra Meeker, and he's going to come in character and talk as if Ezra Meeker was here talking directly to you. So that's a, it's really good. Uh, we love him. And then in June, it'll be uh, Dick Poost. And if you've been here in any length of time, you might recognize him from KGY. He was a, a, the morning host and uh, program director there for many, many years, and he'll talk about local radio history. So... That's in June. And then we take off a few months in the summer from, from these talks and then get back into it around October. And so we'll work on people like uh, Dave McCandry, who's just come out with a book on Captain Cook. And we'll probably have him talk about that book sometime in the, in the fall. And somebody from State Archives, we want to have them uh, give a little talk about State Archives and what they do at the City of Olympia. So it's, it's going to be, uh, in fact, we're open to suggestions. If you have some people that you know are, are good speakers and uh, like local history, we, we would be glad to consider putting them into the schedule in the future. Uh, we're also continuing our twice a month schedule of popular guided tours. Uh, of this house with a longtime employee, Bob Krim, who's standing back here. He has all kinds of great stories about the Schmidt family. He has 60 years working for them. Uh, he was a, a landscape guy, lawn and garden person that they made into a babysitter and, uh, and, uh, and all kinds of stories he's got. But uh, uh, we have those uh, tours, guided tours, twice a month. And they're very popular because we limit them to 15 people. Otherwise, it gets too unwieldy. Uh, but uh, the the calendar is full up through February, but the next ones in March and April and May are open, so you'll need to call ahead and, or email us, and we'll get you signed up and into one of those guided tours on a Tuesday. But we are video recording the History Talks, and uh, we do that every month. Uh, TCTV, uh, Channel 26 does that on cable, on Comcast. And so that is something I should mention, too. All right. I think we're just about ready for the start here. Um, Peter Schmidt had been originally scheduled to do our, our January talk, but he, uh, illness stopped him. He couldn't come today, so I had to move my February talk up to January and, and res reshuffle the schedule a little, little bit. But hopefully he'll completely recover, and uh, we'll schedule him later in the year. But uh, Peter Schmidt, he's 93 years old and has a lot of stories of his childhood here at the house, and it's just wonderful to, to see one of those talks. There was one of those that he gave in 2002 that is still in the cycle of TCTV programs, and once in a while you'll see it on the, on the cable with him. Uh, but hopefully we'll get him back. So, okay. Let me uh, start changing things here a little bit. Um, historic greetings, and then uh, welcome to the monthly history talk series here at the Historic Schmidt House. Uh, I'm Don Trosper, if I haven't said so already. 
and I'm honored to hold the position of Public History Manager for the Olympia Tumwater Foundation. Uh, my thanks go out to the Foundation's Executive Director, John Friedman. Yes? Hello? You were supposed to silence that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, the, oh, okay. Well, the pioneers didn't have to be interrupted by that, I guess. Okay. But John Friedman is our executive director, and I wanted to thank him and the board for allowing me to be a part of this uh, uh, continuing role as caretakers of our rich local heritage through the Olympia Tumwater Foundation. And being related to the road in Tumwater, uh, you can imagine that our family's been here for generations. And uh, that gave me my interest in local history, starting with Tumwater and then expanding into include Southwest Washington history. Uh, I've written books on Tumwater and the Tumwater School District book. Um, also produced radio history features because I work in radio also with KACS 90.5 FM. There's my commercial. And so I'm half time here and half time in the radio station. But I'm excited to carry on the tremendous work of my predecessors and the current staff here at the foundation. Uh, they've not only been great stewards of this historic house, uh, but also have helped enhance the absolute treasure trove of archival material that's housed here down in the basement. And uh, we're going to be hiring an archivist to finish the job that they started with archiving all that collection. And I'm looking forward to digging into it myself. It's going to be great. But I can tell you that in my short time here, I've already learned a lot of new things about Tumwater's history, especially how it relates to the Schmidt family and their impact upon our communities here in the South Sound area. And uh, let me change a photo here. That's Peter Schmidt right there. And it's about 10 years ago, probably, or a little bit more. But... Uh, I've had a chance to briefly visit with Peter when he was here in October, and uh, I heard some of his personal memories and stories then. And one thing, one tidbit that I'd never heard was that in his childhood, in this very house, he has some special memories of that little restroom under the stairway in the front entrance I mentioned earlier. Uh, he said that his mother used to send him there as discipline. Uh, he said that <laughs> uh, he, had to, he was sentenced to stay there until he'd eat his green beans from dinner. And so that was his punishment, it was that little, so when you're going into that little restroom, you'll think of that story now. <laughs> Eat your green beans. All right. I've also gotten to know another iconic figure here at the foundation, Bob Krim, who has uh, worked for and with the Schmidt family for so long that he's like a part of the family. Uh, he has so many stories of his 60 years serving the Schmidts, which he includes in our recently expanded schedule of his popular guided tours of this house twice a month throughout the year, so I already mentioned that. Well, today... I'd like to highlight some of the historic material from the Foundation's archives relating to the impact of our, of Tumwater, on Tumwater and Olympia of the Schmidt family and the Olympia Brewery. When you go back to look at people who have impacted the first permanent American community in Washington State, which is Tumwater, we're the first, uh, you come across names like uh, Dr. Tolmy at Fort Nisqually, uh, founders Michael T. and Elizabeth Simmons, then there's George and Isabella Bush, uh, uh, names like Clanric and Nathaniel Crosby, uh, First Mayor Nelson Barnes, early business people too, such as Gelbach and Biles and Ward and Hayes and Hazard Stevens. And uh, really, we shouldn't uh, ignore the impact that the early circuit riding preachers of the Methodist Church had on the formation and growth of our communities too. Uh, one of those pastors is Ebenezer Hopkins, you see here, and he wrote down a lot of that history. And the, the circuit riding preachers used Tumwater, the church over here across the freeway, that uh, was the Methodist church, and that was their home base. And they'd do, ride the circuit south all the way along the Black River down to Oakville and, and uh, Grand Mound area, and, and they'd make that circuit continually. And Tumwater was their home, home base for the circuit riders. But really, Tumwater was nearly 50 years old when visitors from Montana uh, came for a visit. They moved here and made an impact that is still being felt today. Uh, they were brothers Leopold and Louis Schmidt and Leopold's eldest son, Peter. And they and their descendants were absolutely pivotal figures in Tumwater and Olympia history. And we'll be touching on some of the many aspects of their contribution as we move on to the talk. But first, let me take you back to Tumwater just before the turn of the century. And that would be the 1890s. In the early part of that decade, there was still a lot of excitement and economic momentum from Washington becoming a state in 1889. So the political center of the new state was right next door in Olympia. And the docks at the tip of Puget Sound were expanding commerce here. And the water-powered industry in Tumwater was making a transition from the mills to generating electricity about that time. But to give you some perspective, at this time in history, Victoria was still the sitting queen of England. And our president was Grover Cleveland. Our governor in 1893 was named McGraw. 
and all was looking pretty rosy, but that is until an economic panic hit, and that recession took the wind out of the sails of the economy, especially on the West Coast for many years. Uh, many optimistic plans went sour, companies went into bankruptcy, some of the businesses at the falls of Tumwater were shutting down, and those economic doldrums didn't really turn around until the Yukon Gold Rush took place in 1897, and, uh, and that, uh, of course, provided another market for the Olympia Brewery, too, eventually. Uh, but the Alaska Gold Rush helped revive our economy. Some of those early Tumwater businesses have been quite lucrative, too. You can take, for example, the Tumwater Ice Company, led by President H. Finger. An article in the Washington Standard in 1892 said that the company had even found a market in Victoria, selling four tons of its product per week, ice. Uh, next to that was the Miles and Carter Tannery. Uh, Polk's business directory in 1892 called the tannery one of the largest in the state, making leather for all kinds of purposes, such as strapping for the chair factory that's in Tumwater at the time. In 1892, Clark Biles died, and in September of 1895, his widow, Fanny Biles, sold the property to Leopold Schmidt. Uh, the cash sum of $4,550 was agreed upon, and the deed was made out to the Schmidt brothers. So before I continue along that timeline, let's briefly look at the... Uh, pre-Tumwater history of the Schmitz. Uh, it's a condensed version, by the way. There's an awful lot more to find out, but uh, a lot of detail in the archives that I can hardly wait to dig into. I want to spend some time researching, and I have been already. But Leopold Schmidt himself was born 1846 in Dornassenheim in the state of Oberhasse, Germany. Uh, Leopold was not a brewer, but rather a seaman on sailing ships. At age 14, he went to seaman school in Hamburg and worked for the Hamburg American Line. He arrived in the U.S. in the late 1860s, learning to speak English, reading Shakespeare, according to one source. He worked in Missouri, where he learned carpentry, and that's where he uh, was a part of uh, developing a pipe auger for what became the Meerschaum Pipe Company, which became rather famous. He then went to New York's Great Lakes region. Where, while there, he decided not to return to, the second, to be the second mate on the new largest ship in the Hamburg American Line, which was really pretty fortunate for him because that ship left New York and disappeared with all hands on board. So he escaped a sinking ship. He eventually ventured to Montana during a gold rush there and working as a carpenter building sluice boxes. And he took a paddle wheel boat up the Missouri River as far as it went. And that trip, it says, took three months stopping often to chop wood to fuel the boilers and even having to stop for the buffalo herds crossing the river. It's a, a pretty amazing story. 1874, he got a job working for a Frenchman who owned a successful brewery in Deer Lodge, Montana. A couple years later, Leopold and a partner established their brewery in Butte, the Centennial Brewing Company, and it became the largest brewery in the state. So that inspired Leopold to learn more about the science of brewing. So in 1878, he traveled back to Germany to study at the famous brewing academy in Worms. And us GIs back in the 70s called it Worms, because it's spelled that way, but it's Worms. <laughs> but that's where he met Johanna Steiner. And uh, soon after he completed his studies, the two were married, and they moved to the U.S. and back to Butte, Montana. And their first child was born in 1880. His name was Peter Gustav Schmidt, or Peter G. Schmidt. And over the next 15 years in Montana, the family increased to include five sons and a daughter. So there's their photos right there. But Leopold was more than just a businessman. He was very involved in local leadership. He was a county commissioner for seven years in Silver Bow County in Montana, was a member of the Montana's Constitutional Convention in 1889, and served two terms in their legislature. And he was rather nonpartisan in his attitude, although he had to claim a party, but he was very mid-range, uh, nonpartisan, I guess I should say. It was 1890 that as a member of the Montana Capital Commission that Leopold made a trip out west, and he made a stop in Olympia for ideas about a capital building for Montana. And he was impressed with the South Sound or the Puget Sound area. He always wanted to live near a saltwater port, and not only because he liked the sea, but also there were advantages economically for his family's future. And it wasn't really a vision for beginning a brewery that first drew him here. It was like, like us. He just loved the location. And so it was a far healthier climate, too, than existed in Butte with all the mining operations and the, and the pollution was tremendous there. And so it wasn't healthy for his family. And so it just really desolate due to the mining operations. Uh, so in July of 1895, uh, Leopold made a trip to Oregon and Washington and heard from a local barber who was a fellow German about the pure artesian water in the Deschutes River Canyon. Uh, the local Indians had known about that water for generations, and he sent a sample of it back to a brewer's institute for testing, and the report came back saying it was exceptional water for brewing beer. 
So he went back to Montana and gave an option on the sale of his Montana brewery holdings and then came back west with his 15-year-old eldest son, Peter, and toured from Bellingham all the way to Oregon City and really liked Olympia and Puget Sound and especially liked the property at the foot of the Deschutes. And that's where Biles and Carter Tannery and the Tumwater Ice Company were located. And uh, so he bought that family out, and, or he brought his family out, I should say, and uh, they resided in Portland for two years while Leopold and Peter purchased the property up here we mentioned earlier, and he planned a small brewery. His brother, Louis Schmidt, also moved out from Montana with his family to become the local manager of the operation, and it's a plant that he actually had built. Louis was the main builder. Uh, I'm not only now starting my research into Louis and the crucial role he played, but uh, also his uh, other Schmidts and uh, Adolf Schmidt I'm looking at and, and Bobby Schmidt and they all had nicknames and we'll get into that in a future talk but uh, I mentioned the economic panic of 1893 but I didn't mention that those hard times also affected the up-and-coming breweries in the Pacific Northwest and those little breweries made a rather poor quality of beer and so eastern beer from places like Milwaukee were dominating our market here in Northwest cities and this was despite the high cost of transportation. It was just that much better beer, I guess. And the Schmidt operation right from the beginning of the Capital Brewing Company focused on the highest quality. And that meant quality in many areas. Uh, pure artesian water, uh, the very best ingredients, absolute dedication to sanitary conditions throughout the brewing operation, a high pay to motivate the employees, uh, top-notch promotional and marketing campaigns, and a real commitment to safety at the plant, too. In a short amount of time, the beer from Tumwater displaced mostly all the former domination of the Eastern beers. So they became a, a growing operation very quickly. In fact, I found a story relating to the quality of the Capital Brewing Company product as compared to the Milwaukee beers. I think I'll put my spectacles on, by the way, so I can read my own typing here. Uh, in fact, uh, it comes from a story written in the Washington Standard newspaper by publisher John Miller Murphy in the late 1890s. In fact, you might have a copy of that. I've made a copy of this story. But he, his stories of John Miller Murphy in the Washington Standard were uh, read more like modern-day commercials or puff pieces about the brewery. He was very supportive. Uh, one example of that comes from the beginning of an article he wrote that said, quote, If there's any one thing of which Olympia feels an excess of pride, it is in the splendid product of beer, which has already attracted the attention of connoisseurs, not only in our own state, but in Oregon, California, the length of the Northern Pacific Railway, at Honolulu, in the Philippines, and is rapidly securing a permanent foothold wherever it's introduced. And uh, other articles in that paper mention other markets that the beer was uh, entering in a big way, including the Sandwich Islands, which is Hawaii, uh, Dawson for the Alaska Gold Rush market, and even Shanghai, China. We had Olympia beer, or Capital Brewing Company beer going out there. So here I just have to insert a story I've, I had never heard before. John Miller Murphy related the story of the visit to Olympia of the famous scout and trailblazer, W.F. Carson, better known as Kit Carson. And in his later years, Carson was employed by the Northern Pacific Railway as a freight agent. And then after that, he was with the Canadian Pacific as an assistant general manager or passenger agent, I guess I should say. Uh, Miller hosted Carson at the restaurant of the Olympia Hotel. And he told the story this way, and I'll quote from you. You might have, you have a copy of that article out on the table. During the repast, the host, with a wink at the waiter, ordered up a bottle of Pabst beer. A bottle of pale export of the Capital Brewing Company was placed on the table with the label concealed and drank amid eulogies from Mr. Carson as to the superior qualities of the Milwaukee product. After he had declared, I always recognize the Milwaukee beer where I find it, the writer exposed the label. Mr. Carson jumped from his seat in amazement with the declaration, Great heavens! Can it be possible that any brewery on the Pacific coast can produce beer like this? <laughs> End quote. Uh, that kind of celebrity <laughs> endorsement and the method used to inspire it was a really an early version of our TV commercials we can still see today. The hidden bottle trick, I guess you'd say. So I mentioned the focus on employee safety of the Schmidt operation. I, I did find some articles about accidents, some of which were unavoidable. In the early 1900s, a landslide came down around 10 p.m. from the hillside above the bottling department of the brewery complex, and several tons of earth pushed the building off its foundations, and tree trunks and limbs were thrust through the side of the building, damaging machinery uh, like the steamer, the big uh, machinery they had. And it was quite fortunate that it happened at night during the holiday season, or otherwise many employees could have been killed or injured, but nobody was. Uh, another occasion in 1904 was when plumber George Jones was seriously burned by an ammonia gas explosion set off by the flame of a candle. And uh, he was able... Whoops, I needed to keep up with my photos here. <laughs> 
He was able to escape with his life, but was badly burned anyway. In that story, mention was made of the well-organized fire company composed of the brewery employees who were able to put out the fires despite the fumes of ammonia gas. And yes, those brewery employees were a major part of the volunteer fire department. Another newspaper account was given in 1908 about a big fire at the old Eagle Hotel in Tumwater that was totally destroyed by the flames. And if it weren't for the quick work of the brewery's volunteer fire department, it would have taken out neighboring homes and businesses. But even young Leo Schmidt was injured, according to the headline. And so one of the younger generation of Schmidts took an active part in the heroic efforts of the crew of firefighters. So they were our first fire department, the brewery employees. They didn't use this, but this is... <laughs> I found another mention of an injured Schmidt family member from an article in the Morning Olympian from October 1906. Paul Schmidt, son of Lewis, uh, lost the ends of two fingers on his right hand while working at the Tumwater Brewery. He got his hand caught between a cable and drum while greasing the elevator. Uh, Dr. Ingham dressed the wound, and, and the paper said that the young man was getting along nicely. So there was that. In fact, this is a good place to bring an artifact here. There we are. This was hanging in, well, it's in our archives in the basement, a framed statement from Mr. Schmidt that hung in a prominent place in the plant sometime after the company changed its name from Capital to Olympia Brewing Company. And all, it's hard to read from where you are, so I'll read it to you here. To all employees in the different departments, the management of the Olympia Brewing Company has the earnest desire to protect their employees against all possible harm to limb and body while engaged in work at their plants. It will save no expense whatever to throw all safeguards around every piece of machinery or place where and wherewith any man has to work. In order to accomplish this, we ask all employees to point out to the foreman or management in case the foreman pays no attention <laughs> All places they are to work in and all tools they are to work with when, in their opinion, dangerous. And they are hereby granted the right to refuse to work in such places and with such tools without prejudice on the part of the company. And that hung up in all their plants and, and right here in Olympia, or Tumwater. So I have to handle this carefully because it's turn of the century kind of stuff. All right. I should mention, too, a short clip of a story I found in the Washington Standard that kind of intrigued me. I'm not sure this comes under the title of plant safety, but in a way it does. From February 25th, 1898, this brief mention was printed without embellishment. It says, quote, The foreman of the Capitol Brewing Company was fined $25 in costs by Justice King Tuesday for assaulting the engineer of that institution with a monkey wrench. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> I have not yet found any further details of that incident, but it could well be in one of the archival boxes downstairs, and I'm ready to dig into that one. This is going to be great. The Schmitz uh, became intimately involved not only in the local business community, but also in the communities as a whole. Uh, for example, one of the board members of the first Tumwater grade school on Tumwater Hill was Peter G. Schmidt Sr., son of Leopold. Uh, the Schmidt family additionally made an annual distribution of gifts to the poor children of Tumwater, who might have otherwise been forgotten in the holiday rush. Uh, this $100 annual fund continued on even after Leopold's death as part of his will. He put it right in his will that that keeps going. A Morning Olympian article in December of 1914 said that Philippine, the daughter, was acting as Santa Claus to the children of the Tumwater Club. And a brief quote from the article here says, quote, There will be a Christmas tree on Thursday night and candy, nuts, and toys, and a happy time is being anticipated by the Tumwater children, end quote. And another example of community involvement was found in a newspaper article that stated that Leopold donated uniforms to the semi-pro Olympia baseball team. And after four years of winning seasons, those uniforms were really showing their wear and tear, and they needed new ones for the 1915 season. So a dance was organized to raise funds for that need at the Tumwater Club. Uh, the article said the following, quote, Olympia is going to have one of the best semi-professional teams in this neck of the woods, and the new suits will help put, some, help put some pop in the boys, and the fans will be just as tickled to see the boys come out at that first game of the season, as will the players themselves. So they were all excited about the new uniforms. Like the Mariners. No, no. Okay. Of course, the Schmitz treated their employees very well. An article from the Morning Olympian of 1906 displayed the headline, quote, Christmas at Brewery, Presents and Money for All Employees, Happy Day at Tumwater. And uh, quoting from the article itself, 
Uh, the Olympia Brewing Company's largest or large plant at Tumwater was the scene of much excitement yesterday afternoon from 12 o'clock until 2.30 when the employees were all given Christmas gifts. There are 120 men employed at the brewery and to each were given a cash present ranging from $250 to $40, a box of cigars, and to each of the married men was given, an, in addition, a turkey. There were 124 turkeys given away. The total cost of the presents was about $1,800, which in that time frame was pretty good. And uh, this uh, really would be a great place to share a human interest story involving Leopold Schmidt and a Swede named Ole Hansen. You might have got a copy of that article, too. Uh, the, the story comes word for word from an article in the Morning Olympian of 1910. So that's where this is quoted from. So here's a true story of a brewer, and it would be hard to best it even in a church. Some years ago, Leopold F. Schmidt, the famous Olympia brewer, extended considerable credit, some $11,000, to one Ole Hansen, a well-meaning but unfortunate Swede whose saloon never seemed able to get its head above water. It was not altogether Hansen's fault, for a financial crash and some other things boosted him downhill. Uh, one day he closed the place and gave Schmidt a mortgage on three Seattle lots that were barely worth $2,000 and drifted out of sight. That was more than a decade ago. Well, about a year ago, although the story has never been published, Schmidt, in looking over his vast holdings, got to wondering how and where he got some valuable lots that had been, uh, he'd been paying high taxes on, along with some heavy regrade bills. Why, those were Ole Hansen's lots, said one of the sons of the old brewer. And then the picture of poor little Hansen and his struggle came up before the brewer, the picture of forgotten years. He said nothing to his sons, but began a search for Hansen. Finally, after some weeks, he located his former customer and debtor at the little town of Auburn, where the broken Swede was struggling to pay for a humble cottage. Entering the little place suddenly and finding Hansen, Schmidt exclaimed, You rascal, I have found you at last. I've come to see how much of that balance of $9,000 you can pay me. I'm growing old and feeble now, said Hansen, and my wife is far from well. We're trying to finish paying for this house, and I'm afraid I can never earn $9,000 for you. Give me a mortgage on the house or acknowledge the debt in the presence of witnesses, Schmidt exclaimed. Hardly had he finished speaking when he opened the door and beckoned to a trusted friend in an automobile, and the friend came in with a bag containing $24,000 in gold, all of which was spread on the kitchen table before the astonished gaze of Hansen and his wife, who had been attracted by the commotion. That's your share of the lot, said Schmidt, for they brought $35,000, and I charge you no interest on the old debt. And when old man Schmidt tells the story to a chance friend in strong German accent with tears in his eyes, he usually concludes like this. By dunder, dot woman and her alt man, used hugged me, and we all cried. It was very much fun. If I could have so much fun mit all my money, I'd give it all out, dot ve. <laughs> what a great story. And uh, it reveals a true character of a hard-driving industrialist in a way that shows his German roots. And uh, also uh, that wonderful accent, or maybe I should say wunderbar accent. Uh, but back to our topic of community influence here. It's not commonly known that Leopold uh, built one of the best greenhouses in the South Sound area, uh, located near his home. And there he supplied not only flowers, plants, and shrubs for his house and grounds around here, but also sold the products to the public. And the noted local floriculturist of the area named Conrad Clam, K-L-A-M, was given the operational oversight of that first-class greenhouse and nursery. And in another instance, Leopold observed that Olympia streets were quite well lighted with street lights. He saw that the lights followed the streetcar line up Main Street, but when it, when it came to cross over into Tumwater, there was no lighting at all except at the very end of the line itself. So the little town could never afford a modern lighting system, so Mr. Schmidt, through the Tumwater Power and Water Company they owned, donated the arcs and tungsten lights free of charge to bring it up to par with neighboring Olympia. So that was part of his donation there. The late 1800s and early 1900s were a time of great inventions and innovation, and technology and innovation were also a part of the Schmidt family focus. Uh, one of their projects was making gas out of lignite coal, a project championed by Peter G. Schmidt, the son. Uh, they built their own plant for that purpose near the brewery complex, believing that the venture showed promise as a good investment, uh, what with the abundance of coal available from the Tanino Bucota area to the south. And they even tested out special 300 horsepower engines run from gas that was from that coal and installed them on the schooner Archer. And that ship made the San Francisco to DuPont run in 42 days and made eight round trips with those engines. Uh, the venture didn't last long due to the quick advancements of oil technology and diesel, but uh, for a while that worked. Neighboring Olympia was a 
frequent uh, recipient of the benefits provided by the brewery and the Schmidt family. Uh, one example is the major city of Olympia Park called Priest Point Park. For many years, the centerpiece of that park was the Swiss Chalet. Uh, it had been originally built as an exhibit building for the brewery at the 1903-04 Lewis and Clark Exposition in Portland, Oregon. And when that fair was over, Leopold donated the building to the city of Olympia, specifically for the park. So it was taken apart piece by piece and reassembled at Priest Point Park in 1905, and it survived until 1960, or 1960s. But that's not all. One day, Leopold was standing near the chalet with park board members Dr. Carlion and Dr. Or Mr. Blakesley, and he noticed a tall cedar tree alongside the building that had not been removed or disturbed like the other nearby trees had been. Uh, Blakesley told Mr. Schmidt that they left it standing until they could raise enough money to trim and peel the tree to make it into a wonderful flagpole, a cost that was estimated to be between $75 and $100. And right then and there, Mr. Schmidt said that if the board would go ahead and make that flagpole out of that tree, he would pay for the work and would also present a large U.S. flag to fly it on the top of the 100-foot pole. And it was done quickly, and the flag could be seen for many miles away. The year 1902 was a pretty big year in brewery history. Uh, Leopold's brother, Lewis, was elected mayor of Tumwater, and the brewery changed its name from Capital Brewing Company to Olympia Brewing Company. Uh, the Washington Standard said the reason for the name change was, quote, to more fully identify the brewery with the fame achieved by the excellent product it has so effectively introduced. John Miller Murphy loved the brewery. Uh, but with that change, the change in name, came the first use of the slogan, It's the Water. And that idea came from the front office ad manager, Frank Kenny, who had to convince Leopold to use that slogan in all their promotion and marketing. And it took some real convincing because Leopold thought it was too short and uh, they didn't, didn't, he wanted to use a longer, more descriptive term or whatever. But they considered it over the weekend and then went with Frank's proposal, and we're glad he did. It's the water stuck. Let me take you forward to 1908, and that was when another landmark of Tumwater was built, once again by the Schmitz for the benefit of their employees and the community as a whole. It was a large wooden structure called the Tumwater Club, and it was located near what later became known as Tumwater Square and the Gillette and Guffey Drugstore at the current site of Coldwell Banker Evergreen Olympic Realty Building. Uh, it was a very popular building with the chief attraction being the big 106 by 90 foot ballroom. Uh, there were smaller rooms on the sides and had balconies above with seven feet of space for seating and walkways. It had a gymnasium and health club, quote, equipped with everything calculated to develop the muscles and contribute to the physical well-being of the members, unquote. Uh, there was also a reading room, had more than 200 volumes of works of fiction and science and magazines and newspapers. There was also a billiard room, showers, balcony stairs that were portable so they could be raised to the ceiling when a dance was held. Uh, the large space could also be used for basketball, indoor baseball, and tennis court. And being located on the streetcar line from Olympia to Tumwater, the club was utilized by residents of both Tumwater and Olympia uh, for all kinds of events. Uh, they had the uh, 1908 Legislative Ball, uh, the Red Cross Dances for Soldiers during World War I. Uh, they hosted an inaugural ball in 1921 for Governor Hart. And in later years, during the 1930s and 40s and even into the 50s, it was a roller skating rink and also a bowling alley. Uh, the pins were reset manually. In fact, one of my uncles, my mom's youngest brother, had a job as a pin setter for a time during those high school days. Uh, fire destroyed that building on December 20th, 1955. So our landmark is gone. Another item that shows the Schmidt influence on Olympia, I found in an article in the Morning Olympian from 1912 that stated, quote, Leopold buys Olympia National Bank. The bank, located between 4th and 5th on Main Street, had been owned since 1899 by Captain C.S. Reinhardt, and in 1912 he resigned and Leopold was elected to the board and chosen as president. Frank Kenny of the brewery was elected as cashier and Leopold took controlling interest of the stock. Uh, the plans were to move that bank to a lot the Schmitz owned in Olympia where a new structure was going to be built. Uh, there were other investors too from some of the Mon Montana connections that the Schmitz had from the earlier years. So they were venturing out in all kinds of areas. We've talked a lot about Leopold. We should move ahead and uh, uh, to the next generation, his oldest son, Peter. Uh, he was an innovative young man who had been involved with the brewery operation right from the start. In fact, he actually became the youngest brewmaster in the nation at the time. Uh, he was self-taught in engineering and loved working on the plans for buildings and equipment and, and technology that we mentioned earlier. Uh, one story told about Peter's younger days is when he wanted to go to Germany to visit relatives, so he signed up to fly there on the dirigible Hindenburg. His ticket was for the flight just after the final fatal explosion in New Jersey. 
Uh, the family trademark of that lucky horseshoe just may have reflected some of the family's fortunes and choices um, in not, not getting that earlier ticket on the Hindenburg. Things were going quite well for the Olympia Beer Company and uh, Schmidt's other business ventures in the Northwest and beyond, but then came Prohibition. All breweries and distilleries were shut down by the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, although Washington State adopted it a couple years earlier than the rest of the nation. So the question was, what would happen to the brewery and the Schmidt family? After all, they were one of the largest employers in the area, and they were making a huge impact on our communities in many ways. Would they give up altogether, maybe try to adapt the plant in some way? Well, they tried to adapt for a while, switching to the production of apple juice or apple juice. It cost the Schmidt $60,000 to retrofit the brewery to produce apple juice, and actually it employed more men than the brewery had. Uh, they put out a very high quality product, you need to expect that from the Schmidts, handling 500 tons of apples a day, storing a million gallons of juice, but in the long run it did not succeed. It closed in 1920 due mostly to the volatile sugar prices caused by World War I. So, by this time, Leopold had passed away and the next generation was in charge, and they sent it, or ended up selling the plant property in Tumwater and pursued other ventures and investments. Uh, that included the hotel business. Uh, Peter, Peter founded Puget Sound Hotels, which was the predecessor to the Weston Hotels that we know of today. Uh, Peter and his brother Leo also started Northwest Transportation Company and got into interstate bus service and heavy trucking operations in Oregon and Washington on the old Pacific Highway. Uh, their transportation company grew into Greyhound bus lines, and Peter also served on the Olympia Port Commission for 18 years and was a force behind the formation of the Olympia Airport. His efforts in that arena led to the eventual development of United Airlines. So they had their hand in a lot of things. His wife, Clara, was also very instrumental in the arts for the community, including bringing in symphonies and other cultural events in Olympia. So before I move on, I'd like to briefly return to Leopold Schmidt. Is it's interesting to note, to note what uh, Leopold thought about the idea of prohibition, uh, viewed from a philosophical basis tempered by his German heritage and culture. I found a Morning Olympian article that was written after Leopold had returned from a 14-month trip around the world and back to Germany, just before World War I had broken out. And the elder Schmidt made some comments regarding Europe and the United States. He said that Germany as a whole was friendly to the U.S., and the people even wanted to participate in the Panama Exposition in San Francisco, highlighting their industrial rather than their agricultural interests. He said that the European nations, like the Americans, were becoming more temperate in the use of intoxicating liquors, and he said that over there the sentiment in regard to the use of alcoholic liquors was changing. Quote, no more is it proper for a person to indulge to excess. Abroad, they handle the subject in a much more efficient manner than they do here, on every hand, the tendency is towards moderation. And Schmidt added, the public will learn in time to use the lighter alcoholic liquors as beverages and to quit drinking the distilled liquors, which are stimulants and medicines, end quote. He thought that eventually the attitude in the U.S. would become as they were in the old countries, in that when a man became intoxicated, they would force him to leave the place while the others remained, rather than the other way around. He believed that uh, prohibition was not the proper solution to the drink problem, our next slide here shows an advertisement the brewery sponsored to persuade the public to reject prohibition. You might see that a little bit there. So next, we fast forward to the 1930s and the repeal of the 18th Amendment. In December of 1933, 36 states ratified that repeal and beer was once again legal. Uh, the Schmidt brothers, Peter and Adolf, anticipated the lifting of prohibition, once again catching the vision of brewing Olympia beer, utilizing that famous pure water of Tumwater. The modern vision required more modern and efficient facilities, though, so rather than trying to remodel the old site at the Lower Falls, they decided to build an all-new upstream facility. Uh, they still had a few gallons of their original yeast strain they stored in a Midwest laboratory, so they were set to go. They decided to finance the new operation by becoming a stock company, and uh, they issued three, 300,000 shares of common and 150,000 shares of what was called goodwill stock, which the family owned. Uh, they offered the common shares at a dollar each, the price soon rose to $1.25 and then $1.50. The Schmitz themselves went all around the area, door to door, offering these shares to people all around the community, including my own grandfather, Bill Trosper. Uh, he decided against it because he would have had to risk mortgaging his property. And then he kicked himself many times over the years for not taking advantage of that offer. <laughs> if you can imagine, uh, well, a young guy that started Microsoft, if you got in early on that, you know, that kind of thing. But those original shares, through splits and growth in the company, became worth around $200 each, with the dividends becoming a dollar a share, the original value of the stock. 
So the financial hindsight is comparable to getting involved with that young Seattle kid and his idea that he called Microsoft, one of those if-only thoughts. Uh, okay, longtime employee at the brewery, uh, Jack Frisch, said that the wages to start with in 1934 were 60 cents an hour. And he said his first year's wages totaled $900, which was pretty good work in those depression years. It said that when brewery unions would call for strikes, the local Olympia employees voted against them, showing the loyalty of the Schmitz. I still hear former employees talk about how Bobby Schmidt would come through the plant every morning, personally greeting the workers and visiting with them. Uh, they were just very personal uh, employers. Peter Schmidt was very involved in the design of the buildings and equipment of the new brewery, of course. He worked quite closely with their hired architect, the renowned Joseph Woldeb, who designed so many of the buildings in the Olympia area. Uh, Peter spent many hours in Wolob's office, guiding him with his sketches and drawings so that Wolob would make the final official drafts. He had to educate Wolob about the intricacies of building for an efficient modern brewing operation. Lots of technology involved in the designs, and Peter really knew his stuff. Uh, Peter and Adolf and the family definitely carried on the tradition set by Leopold of being a first-class employer and leading in the philanthropic efforts, enhancing the communities of Olympia and Tumwater. In fact, 1950, the Schmitz created a nonprofit entity known as the Olympia Tumwater Foundation. Uh, the vision was to wisely invest in various philanthropic ways into the communities, and one of their first community projects was an idea that Peter had of donating a brass replica of Copenhagen's famous fountain at the Tivoli Gardens and installing it at the state capitol grounds. And that foundation gifted it and had it installed and running by 1953. And visitors and local residents have enjoyed that fountain for generations. In 1957, a brand new elementary school was built by the Tumwater School District. It was located on Old Highway 99 and Dennis Street on a vacant piece of land that had hosted visiting carnivals and a circus. Uh, the new 12-unit grade school opened in that year with the name Peter G. Schmidt Elementary School. And there was some controversy at first about naming the school for a family famous for brewing beer. <laughs> but that faded away when Mrs. Peter Schmidt donated $10,000 for the project. <laughs> Clara, too, was continuing the Schmidt tradition of community support and particularly support of education. As we come to the 1960s and 70s, we begin to deal with another member of the Schmidt family. He was known by his lifelong nickname, Skip Schmidt. His formal name was Philip Henry Schmidt, son of Adolf Daniel Schmidt and grandson of Leopold. Uh, I was privileged to conduct an interview with him back in 1994 at Tumwater City Hall along with Jill Kangas, who was working for the city at Henderson House Museum at the time. And one of the first things he said to me was the following, quote, you know what they say, two things that happen to you as you get old. First the mind goes, and I can't think of the other. <laughs> so I, I, I liked him right away. <laughs> Let me uh, relate a few excerpts from the interview that he gave to give you a feel for the personality of Skip and some of his family history. He said, I was born in a little house my father and mother owned right across from the Olympia Brewing Company. It was for a short time the Tumwater Police Department. That's this little building out here, this little house. He was referring to that house that's been, you know, different small restaurants and so on that's been there. Uh, at that time I was born, my Aunt Philippine was visiting, and she took my brothers and sister down to the Rialto Theater to see East is East and West is West. So my name, Philip, came from Philippine, and her name is spelled just like the island. My middle name, Henry, came from my father's best friend, Henry Henniam, and a shirt tail relative by the name of Henry Shupp. My father had just finished a new boat, which he named after my mother, and the little card said to the new skipper of the Winifred, so my name started that day I was born. Skipper, skip. I didn't know what my real name was until I went to grade school. <laughs> I didn't like Philip or Phil. I don't mind them now, but I do go by Skip. <laughs> That's his quotes. I love it. Um, and I can in uh, interject something, too, from another old newspaper article talking, talking about the Schmidt family nicknames. It said that at the birth of the new child, family friend Dick Burford gave the mother a bath thermometer for the baby, and the comment on it was, so the skipper won't get his bottom burned. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought I said, Skip has passed away now, so I can talk about it. No, 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 no. But back to our quotes from Skip. Um, he said, I attended Lincoln School and the old William Winlock Miller High School. In 1939, I started working at the brewery. I suppose they would be in real trouble from labor laws and child labor and that sort of thing since I was 16 years old. I did a lot of different jobs in the brewery. Eventually, was in charge of engineering and planning, including design and construction of the Tumwater Falls Park and Tumwater Valley. I left the brewery in 1974 and went into contracting business. Politics was really an accidental thing. 
having coffee with Wes Barcliffe at Tumwater Valley Restaurant when Arnold Ball was running it. He asked, did you ever think about running for office? Hell no, I said. <laughs> he, he said, uh, Barcliffe said, well, you know, George Jackson has decided he isn't going to run again. Why don't you try for that position? And he talked to George, who thought I should run, and they convinced me to run for the council, and I won. Wes had to resign the mayorship later due to state retirement rules, and I was appointed as his, his replacement as mayor. I then ran for re-election for that and won, and that means I was seven years on the council and seven years at mayor, end quote. Uh, Skip mentioned the development of the Tumwater Falls Park in Tumwater Valley. Uh, the park was developed under Peter's instigation in 1962 and has been enjoyed by residents and visitors alike for all the years since then. Uh, in fact, those concrete boats have been played on by generations of kids. Yeah, I remember playing on them when I was a kid, so that shows how old they really are and how well they've held up. <laughs> but uh, the Falls Park Trail, the, the beautiful landscaping and footbridges, the views of the falls, uh, the salmon ladders and picnic facilities have been a real draw for our community and has brought multiple thousands of visitors off the freeway to enjoy the Tumwater amenities. And in our archives at the Schmidt House, we were recently donated some of the original proposals that consultants submitted for a future park that would encompass the entire valley right up through where the golf course now is. Uh, the golf course was not yet a goal, but some of the ideas were quite entertaining. Uh, the conceptual drawings were a style similar to, well, Seattle World's Fair at the time, Jetsons cartoons, real modern style, you know, very modernistic and futuristic. Uh, there were proposals for a park and picnic areas and camping and swimming, a train ride around the entire grounds, a living history working logging camp, a pitch and putt, a section for retirement living, commercial and professional offices, all kinds of plans and all put together to attract visitors and be an active center for the South Sound area. So those original proposals were changed quite a bit, but it turned out that it was really a great gift by the Schmitz to the community. Uh, today, the park here is privately owned and operated by the Olympia Tumwater Foundation, and which also owns and takes care of the Schmidt House, which we're in now. Uh, boy, there's so much, so much more to learn about the history of the brewery in our area. Let me, there we go. <laughs> that's a familiar look, and that's the, the park. But there's so much more to learn about the brewery history and uh, uh, from the rich archives that we have here at the Schmidt House. And I, like I said earlier, I'm excited to delve into it all. I found out that Leopold was very active with the Elks Lodge and the family have always been a part of the St. John's Episcopal Church. Uh, the Schmitz built businesses and employed lots of workers at good wages. They served their communities and put Tumwater and Olympia on the map nationally and internationally. Uh, with the promotional campaigns of the Olympia Brewing Company with the slogan, It's the Water, and those famous artesian campaign commercials. Uh, the tours of the brewery were a gigantic draw for visitors traveling I-5. The Schmidt legacy really lies not merely in buildings and parks and education and foundational work. The, their real legacy is people, and that's what all these buildings represent. The Schmidt family support for all the community projects and institutions that we've mentioned during this talk uh, shows that one family can have a dramatic influence on the character and culture of an area. Uh, their example of honesty, hard work, fairness, uh, top quality, taking calculated risk and dealing with the consequences, both good and bad, in an honorable way, all have made a huge impact on many lives. And I've only scratched the surface in this presentation. I'm, I'm working on research on key figures like Lewis and Adolph and Bobby and hope to do a future talk on their part in this story, in this rich history. Today, the foundation continues, and the influence of the Schmidt family is still being felt, even though the brewery was sold by the family to Pabst in 1983 because they just couldn't compete efficiently with the larger companies. Uh, Pabst later sold to Miller and a South African company. For us longtime residents of Tumwater, the last blowing of that familiar brewery whistle in 2003 was a signal that times were truly changing. And it remains to be seen what will develop with the old brew house complex and uh, the more modern upstream facilities, but we do know that whatever rises upon that property will be built upon the strong foundations laid before by the Schmidt family. So thank you for the for this main part of the talk, I debated about how to handle the question and answer time, and I decided that I might get to your stories after we close out the talk. The remaining time, I think I'd like to do a quick slideshow of some slice of life history based upon the employee's monthly magazine published by the brewery in the 1950s and 60s called It's the Water. And this just go through some of the cover pages of those publications. It's just like looking at the history of the 50s and 60s. Uh, here's a, a new industry employing 100 people and what it means to uh, hotels and tourism and construction and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is from 19, I put my glasses back on, uh, May of 1959 and talk, uh, kind of a model of some of the, what they were going to develop and some of the technology. 
Uh, November of 59 showed uh, a worker in the canning part, the, the aluminum cans. Um, December of 1959, season greetings, kind of a stylized version of the, of the river and the brewery. Uh, May 1960, it shows looking ahead towards uh, this whole decade of up to 1970, and they have a part for uh, Washington and one for Oregon and one for Idaho there, and uh, they call it the Soaring 60s. In the news, uh, July 1960, little baseball, they got involved with the kids. Uh, November 1960, talking about the latch string is always out and the tours of the brewery, which is such a draw from the highway. <clears throat> this is the, uh, the fish uh, focus on the salmon coming up the river in the falls there, November 61. Uh, this is a good good one. Ni 1962 in May, that's the Miss Tumwater doing a, a leap over the water there <laughs> at the Seattle World's Fair with a space needle in the background. I like that one. Uh, this is a uh, not November of 62 when they rebuilt the uh, the iconic footpath bridge over the falls. This is uh, on target with safety. Safety always a focus for the brewery, even in the modern era. This is March of 63. Uh, I don't know the name of this person. If you're a longtime brewery employee, you might know who that is, but uh, one of the employees in May of 63, and they featured him on the cover. Uh, Lake Fair, the float, they, that was part of the community, July of 63 in this case. I don't know who the queen and princesses were in 63, but that's a picture of that. Uh, this is another stylized version of that footbridge in March of 64. Kid fishing on the dock there in May of 64, and it's the water news. This is neat stuff. Uh, this is Adolf Bumpschmidt, Jr., as one of the covers in September of 64. Uh, November of 64 in the fall, uh, Nice version with the leaves turning color there, and showing the modern facility. And a picnic in September of 65. Nice little bikini there. <laughs> um, Olympia Dark Beer was featured in the March 1966 issue. It's the Water News. This is a retirement, planning to enjoy it, so a retirement issue for that, for that July of 66. I don't know who those couple are either. Uh, and then the part of the crew there, Bump Schmidt, is giving them advice and direction, you know, and so on, how to how to do some part of the operation, no doubt, of six, 1967. Uh, here's <laughs> uh, it's the water news from December of 1967, and a kind of a stylized Christmas draft of beer with balls in it. <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of funny. Uh, then there's oh, this is what I, I love. This is like a laugh in, or that era of the 60s, 1968. So it's a, a safe trip, 20-year scene, bowl in, uh, all kinds of things on that, all in that style. This is the, uh, uh, one of the covers in 68 about the new golf course that they finally built. And some of the people of the brewery, some of the people, I, I, I don't know very many of them, but some of them were my high school teachers later on. Uh, Ananen, I recognize Schott. Uh, let's see, who else? To, oh, uh, Ward is there, Bill Ward, and some others. So you might recognize some of those faces on that cover from 1969. I see your pointings. I'll, I'll hold on that one for a little bit. <laughs> I like the glasses on that one guy, really dark rim glasses. And then uh, December of 1971, it's the water news. Merry Christmas again. So that's pretty much it. But uh, I want to thank you. And I, let's see, what, yeah, we have some time for comments. And I, I know you're going to have some brewery memories you want to share with me. So. Uh, our questions, I don't know if I can answer all of them, but uh, I'll open it up for the to the floor. Yes? Uh, the Peter Schmidt that is now is 93. Uh -huh. uh, is that a son or a grandson? Yeah, he's a, be a grandson, Leopold Schmidt Jr. And uh, so, yeah, he's... He's a grandson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just out of curiosity, do we know how much a can or... Was it in cans or bottles that they... It must have been bottles that they... Brewed the beer in. I mean, they sold the beer in, right? Well, it started off with bottles and kegs, of course, that they'd send, and everything had to be very sanitary in order to keep it fresh during shipping all over these markets that they sent to. So uh, everything was highly regulated for, for cleanliness to keep that beer in good quality. About how much the bottle of beer was in I don't case. have that yet. I'm sure we have that in our records, of course. But anybody remember what a bottle of beer cost back <laughs> I, I had a question about the, uh, the greenhouse that you mentioned. Uh -huh. Where was the location of that? Was that it was somewhere near the grounds here, and I, I, I'm not clear on that. I, I'm going to have to do some more research looking at the old photos, but I, I thought I saw a photo that showed it up in this side of the house, perhaps. 
but I, I'm not clear on that. And I don't know how long it lasted, because once uh, Bob got, in, got involved here, he said there was more like a farm around here. There was a barn out here and, a, and, a, and another house and little outbuildings, and they had cattle and sheep around here and that kind of thing. So one of Bob's tours, he'll tell you all about that and how uh, Clara Schmidt talked him into uh, shearing sheep for the first time in his life. <laughs> but I won't ruin that story because Bob tells that during his tour. <laughs> Anything else? Any memories of the brewery that you might have? How many were here to hear that final whistle? Uh, yeah, a lot of people were. Yeah. Yes? I'll just say something. Um, I came here in the fall of 73, and I was a teacher at Tumwater at the time. And the first day we spent uh, at the district offices filling out paperwork, the second day we met here at the brewery and went through the brewery and were reminded heavily that our tax base was brewery and uh, you better respect the brewery. So, I mean, it was from the get-go. Yeah. We knew where we were coming from. So If it weren't for lots the Schmitz and the brewery, we would have been gobbled yeah, up by Olympia. Yeah, lots of respect. So. And yeah, they got the tasting room at the end. Oh, yeah. The taste, yes. <laughs> and soda pop, too, not just beer. Yeah, that's right. That's right. A lot of people would try to bypass the tour to get to that tasting room. <laughs> Anything else? Yes? Don, I wanted to ask you, the Boston Street Bridge, the, uh, the original, uh, where is that in relationship to today? Well, that's the uh, bridge that you cross now by the Falls Terrace. Okay. And, uh, and this end of the bridge was the end of the streetcar line. So the, the little streetcar line shed or depot, I guess you'd say, was at the end of that bridge. Yeah. And so that was the end of the streetcar line from Olympia up to Tumwater. And then uh, the, what's now the Falls Park was made into a wildlife park, kind of an early version of Northwest Trek. Uh, and uh, uh, Hazard Stevens was involved in that, and he uh, built that to try to draw people out from Olympia to Tumwater to visit and have their picnic lunches out there and see the elk that they had corralled and, and even some bear and swans and things like that. So it was an early version of Northwest Trek. And that streetcar line was the main the main uh, transportation from Olympia to here. And then when the brewery got started, they built an extension of that streetcar line down to the old plant there. And they had a streetcar that towed a flat car, and they could put the kegs on the flat car, haul them up the streetcar line down to the docks in Olympia. And when that uh, streetcar would come up with a load of kegs, everybody's lights in town <laughs> faded because it took so much power to get that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the early days of water-powered electricity generation. Anything else? Yes? What's the history of the, the separation of the property at the, at the waterfront and the old tower and the rest of the building? Well, uh, the, that comes with Prohibition, and they had to shut down Operation and Cell down there when, the, when Prohibition shut them down, and after the apple juice venture <coughs> didn't work. And so when, they, when the Prohibition was lifted, they decided they it was going to cost too much to try to modernize that facility down there, so they build up here from scratch, so they can put in all the new technologies and and make it uh, expandable. You know, and, and so that that became the new operation where this was the old. And they used this for storage. Then eventually they bought it back from whoever owned it, and that became storage for bottles and cans and things like that. Penny, uh, do you have any um, information on the um, the fountain? The, the one that's the Tivoli at the brewery. Oh, 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 yeah, I don't have any info on that. Yeah. Uh, I believe I used to work for the man that built that, huh. Roy, Roy Palm. Palm? Oh. Yeah, and I just wondered if you had any information on that. I haven't that. run that across be, that yet. That would be of interest. That maybe. would be. Anything else? All right, thank you. And to come back next month, we have a, a Karen Johnson coming to talk about our part of the Oregon Trail called the Cowlitz Trail. Thank you very much.